Welcome back, everybody. Glad to have you here. I'm going to do something a little different today. Uh, I've been doing uh, some music video reactions, um, some music you've never heard of, of course. The uh, I've been doing some trailer reactions, and I wanted to kind of start doing some other stuff because I follow a lot of people on YouTube. Um, there's some people that I really like following. There's some people I follow that I just follow. Uh, just kind of like to keep abreast of situations, but I don't particularly care for them. But I do like reacting to stuff. I do feel like I have a lot to say about stuff. Whether anybody wants to hear it or not is a completely different story. Uh, but I wanted to react to something to one of the people that I do follow that I do love following tremendously. And that is Critical Drinker. Um, Critical Drinker is a novelist. Uh, he also does movie reviews and a lot of insight on movies and stuff like that. And if you don't follow him, I'll post a link down below to his channel. But uh, he's fantastic to listen to um, and I love it when he when he discusses things and I'm always like yeah or I want to get into a conversation with him but I'm watching like one of his videos and I have nothing to say but now I have something to say so and I have a way to say it and I can get into those conversations so I wanted to react to one of the videos he put up a couple days ago uh, I have not watched this video uh, but the thumbnail kind of grabbed my attention and uh, this is this is on his second channel, I believe, which is Jinkers Tracers. Um, I think that's the name of his channel here. Hold on. Uh, after Hours, Critical Drinker After Hours. I think that's his second channel. He also has his first, I think he has two channels now. Um, and obviously I, I, I haven't paid attention to what the, <laughs> to what the uh, other channel name was. I believe he just has Critical Drinker and then he has Critical Drinker After Hours. Uh, and this is where he does a lot of uh, talking to other YouTubers, having conversations. Uh, I haven't had a chance to sit down and listen to a full, you know, conversation that he has with these, but he posts up clips and stuff. I saw this clip, Nobody Cares About the House of Dragon, and I was like, yeah, actually, I've been thinking that lately. And then I saw this clip, and I'm like, I'm going to react to it. So I'm going to react to it, see what you guys think. And uh, this is a rather lengthy video, because it's about 17 minutes long or something like that and um, 13 minutes long. So I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, but I, I will react to it at points when I feel like there's something to say. So let's uh, check it out. And uh, actually I'll put it up here on, so you guys can get the full view and I'll be down here and we'll see what it's like. Let's check it out. Oh, like always, I'm sorry. Make sure you jab that like button, hit subscribe, ring the bell. Comment below, please. I want to hear what you what you have to say about this. I'd love to get into conversations with you about this. And uh, please share with your friends. Let me know what they think. When we were talking about this kind of thing, there's uh, there's someone who did, decided to weigh in on this this entire discussion. And you see if you can share the article here. Um, whenever there's an article, it's bad news. There's, there's so many rings of power articles. Ah, fuck it. Oh, I love that picture. Um, yeah, it was a little, a little taste from George R. R. Martin saying, "I don't understand why uh, people can come to hate something that they love, uh, sorry, they once loved." So, talking kind of simultaneously about toxic fandom within Lord of the Rings and uh, and towards his own shows, which um, I mean, well, has he never had a girlfriend? Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Never been forced to really. Uh, one of the amazing things, he basically says people like brand, so you should just like brand. And no matter what brand says or does, you, you like brand, right? You like Star Wars, you'll always like Star Wars. Star Wars could do anything, but you like Star Wars. And then, if you don't like that, you don't like Star Wars. You're just not a real fan in his eyes. Uh, uh, I, I think it's. Yep, and this is an attitude that's being taken by the owners of these. Uh, uh, these bases, you know, Disney owns um, <clears throat> Star Wars and they own Indiana Jones, they own all of Lucasfilm, they own, you know, Marvel now, and of course, uh, HBO, Warner Brothers, they own uh, the, ho the whole Game of Thrones IP, and, uh, and that's something, like, if you come out and criticize it, they're just like, you know, why do you, ha why do you hate it? Uh, I don't stop loving what I love regardless of what the, what the IP is uh, I don't stop loving what I love just because you came out with something bad I might hate the, that instance of it but that doesn't mean I mean I didn't stop hating Star Wars just because of episode 8 
I still love Star Wars very much. I grew up with Star Wars. I watched Star Wars in the theater when I was seven years old, and it blew my mind. And I've been a fan of it, you know, since I was seven. So, and and, and nothing's going to change that. But there are instances where they put stuff in that I don't necessarily like. The whole prequel trilogy, um, after Episode Three came out, I was like, you know, they could have cut all three of those films down to about one film and I think it would have been fine. I think everything else was pretty superfluous. Uh, I think they did some things bad and I've and I've had com- long conversations with friends about where they messed up, where they messed up with like changing the age of Anakin from 18 to 8 because they wanted to appeal to like the little kid audience. I was 7 years old when I saw Luke Skywalker at 18 on Tatooine and he appealed to me just fine. But you went and took him and made him 8 and so then 10 years later and he's 18 and Amidala is 28. It's kind of like, okay, she's robbing the cradle, isn't she? You know, that, that, it, it, never, it never really worked for me. But I was like, okay, so they made that decision. They went and killed Darth Maul. I thought that was a huge error. Uh, I think they should have had a, a arcing villain with that and, and like they did with Darth Vader in the, in the original trilogy. Um, Lo- uh, Game of Thrones, um, I liked. Read the books. Saw the, saw the show and liked so we'll get into that in a second but just because you don't like certain instances I mean episode 8 of Star Wars was garbage at least half of what it was I actually enjoy the Ray and um, <laughs> I can't even think of his name right now because I'm like starting to get in the Star Wars mode now The but you know Ray's storyline I really enjoyed the rest of it I thought was crap I thought I didn't I don't th- I think they messed up in a bunch of different ways about that I'll make a separate video about that because if I get into Star Wars I'll start man, rambling forever let's get back to the conversation it's, it's so funny when he's like I can't understand the, the animosity that there is now towards the um, TV shows like did you watch season 8 at all like that, that pass you by George um, I wouldn't be surprised if he has I mean it, it, it's an interesting thing right because I genuinely don't know anyone who's talking about um, House of the Dragon. Like, there's, there's nope. still a lot of chat on Rings of Power because everyone seems to fucking hate it. There's obviously a lot of chat around Star Wars and all that sort of thing, but nobody seems to give a shit about House of the Dragon. I don't. The trailer just came and went like a fart in the wind. And I think, honestly, the ship has sailed with Game of Thrones. I think the, the normies have lost interest in it now because they, they saw Game of Thrones and even they recognised the season 8 was kind of shit and they just thought, right, I'm, I'm done with this now, I'm not interested anymore. And the hardcore fans are just probably pissed off that he's focusing energy on this and not writing Winds of Winter. I'm going to stop right there because that sums me up perfectly. Um, sorry about the dog. I, I, I picked up Game of Thrones back in 2000 and five or six somewhere around there and I picked it up not realizing that it was a seven book series and so when I finished the first book I went to find the others and found that you know it's supposed to be a seven book series but there are only I think there were only three of them at that time I can't remember I think it was I think it was three four hadn't come out yet and four came out about a year later and I started and I looked at the I didn't really think about it and I looked at the dates of publication and realized that between issue issue one between the first book and the fourth book there was something like five years or something like that and I was like well that's not too bad maybe it was six years but then that but then the fifth book didn't come out for like two three four years the in fact when it came out I believe the series was already in effect so we got book five still have not gotten book six to this day okay and of course episode everybody was like okay so we'll get the books before you know the seventh and eighth um, seasons of Game of Thrones comes out because you know he's going to write those before you know the ending so he writes the ending and, and, and HBO was like uh, we're coming out with these series whether you like it or not and we'll have to we'll write our own ending and that's what happened um, I eventually got the fifth book I read about half of it and then put it down it wasn't really tracking with what was going on with the series 
and I wasn't that invested in the characters anymore. And honestly, when book six comes out, book seven comes out, I have no intention of buying them or reading them. I haven't even finished book five. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna care. I don't care. He he's absolutely right. Season eight came and that was it for me. I didn't care about anything else after that. I I, I got my ending. Whatever he writes, it's gonna be an alternate alternate ending now. I hate to tell you this, but whether you started it or finished it, who finishes it writes the ending. Anything after that is an alternate. Everything after that is an, is an alternate future or, or, or an alternate reality or, or retelling. And I'm willing to bet you that he wants to rewrite his own stuff because he didn't like that ending. But now he's kind of stuck with what all his characters are and he doesn't know how to take them this way and that. He has characters that are alive that are dead in the show. He has characters that are dead that are alive in the show. And now he doesn't know how to finish it up. And so he hasn't even written book six and seven. And the thing that ticks me off most is that as a wannabe writer, I would love to be a writer that writes these kind of books. To disrespect your fan base that way just irritates me to no end, which is just another reason why I'm not going to buy any more of his books. He has focused on on, on Game of Thrones, the series. He, he Now he's focusing on House of the Dragon. He's focused on Hedge Knight stuff. He's focused on other stuff all over the place, except for Game of Thrones. And you can't even you can't even be arsed to sit down and just finish two more books, but you can write three or four or five other books that had nothing to do with Game of Thrones. Of course, he does Hedge Knight, which is set in, in in that area and stuff, but it's not Game of Thrones. And yeah, it's just like I mean, there, I mean, even 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 when you know when when Wheel of Time, when Robert Jordan died, you know, they still wouldn't got Brett Sanderson to finish up that series. And like finish it for the finish it for the finish it for the uh, for the fans because it would have been terrible. I didn't read the series. My brothers did. I did not. Um, but if you if you're twelve issue twelve books into a series and and, and you die, and and the, and the and the author dies, you're just kind of like, wow, what's gonna happen now? They were they were wise enough to go out and get somebody to finish that and put a bow on it and and finish it up nicely. From what I heard, he did an excellent job. Same thing goes with my favorite writer, David Gimmel. He died halfway through the third book of his Troy trilogy, but he left enough notes and character development notes with his editor and his wife that his wife was able to finish writing the book after his death. And I, I was honestly a little bit um, nervous about that because, as I said, he is my favorite writer. I love David Gimmel more than anything. I think his travesty of his stuff has been converted into TV or books because I think his stuff is beyond 90%, 95% of what's on TV today um, or in the movies today and that he that he was wise enough to leave that information for his wife and for his editor to finish. When I finished, when I read the third book, when it finally came out and I read it I found two lines in the entire book that didn't sound like him. Like he had that preparation and that forethought that when, when he died at his keyboard which he literally did um, he had enough left so that he, knowing that he probably wasn't going to finish it, he left so much information behind that it could be completed for his fans, and that the, and that the story could be finished more than anything. George R. R. Martin doesn't care. He doesn't care about finishing that book. He's not going to finish it. He's going to die before before those get finished. And the truth is, nobody cares. There might be a few out there that care. I don't. So. Yeah, and I don't and I don't care about House of Dragon because uh, every everything I know about House of Dragon was was built up in um, in uh, in Game of Thrones, and it's a great history. But I really don't care to go back and serve it. And and, and if you're gonna put that out before you even finish your your original IP, no respect, man. No respect at all. I feel like it pleases no one. Nobody's interested in the show. Exactly.
it's like, oh yeah, you know, if we get seven Emmys and they get six, I'll be fine with that. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, it's a big factor. We can all do amazing at the Emmys. But that's who he cares about. He cares about the awards. He cares about the yeah. ceremony. Yep. Yeah, it's just the, the prestige, the, the accolades, the ego yeah. broken, just all that shit. This is what I've said. If you're making TV for Emmys, if you're making movies for Oscars, you're not making your you're not you're not a creative for the creative reasons. You're you're a money hungry um, commercialist, and you are not a artist. It's just that simple. Because I'll get I'll, I'll tell you right now. You take the last twenty movies that won the best Oscar. Um, I guarantee you, none of those twenty, maybe two or three, maybe two or three of those twenty end up in my top fifty of all time. It's just that simple. So many of those movies are just like, I mean, come on, who, who remembers English Patient? You see it? Like, I never even watched it. Everybody tells me it's boring. I'm like, I believe you. Because I've seen what, I've seen what they, and they'll give lip service now. You know, they have 10 Oscar nominations now because they want to give lip service to like, you know, the movies that actually go out and make a billion dollars a year. The ones that the fans care about. And will you stop, please? Go. Dogs. They don't care about the fans. They don't care about the commercial success, which actually determines how great a movie is. If your movie is great, it will do well. Period. If your movie sucks, it's going to tank. Take a look at Morbius. Okay? Morbius is a Spider-Man character. Everybody's kind of hyped for that. And it tanked because it sucked. But then you take a movie like Titanic. That movie cost $200 million to make 20 years ago. 20 years ago, that movie cost $200 million. They were getting ready to shut that down. They wanted to shut down James Cameron. They didn't want to finish that movie. They were worried the studio was going to go broke on it. That movie came out and made a billion dollars. It set the record that wasn't beat until the MCU came along. Right? You take a look at all the MCU movies that came out. How many of those have made a billion dollars? Two billion dollars. You take you take the combined net worth of the MCU, and nobody else can touch it. But how many Oscar nominations do they have that are not technically related? How many Best Actor awards? How many Best Picture awards? They gave a platitude to uh, Black Panther, but they, they weren't going to give it to him. You know, for best for Best Picture. You know, how many of those do they do? I mean, take a take a look take a look at. Um, Take a look at um, um, Lord of the Rings, the original trilogy. Take a look at those nominations. And first two movies, did not win, did not win. And then, when the third one was done, everybody's like, you know what? That was really awesome. They deserve the recognition. And then they win like 13 Oscars. Because they knew they owed it to them. Right? So the Oscars don't matter. If I, if I know I, my, cre- my art is going to be successful. If I put it into a movie theater and it costs me $5 million to make and I make $100 million, that's a successful movie. If I put a movie in, if I put a movie in there and I spend $100, $100 million, $200 million on it and it makes a billion, that's a successful movie. Okay? If you're the Blair Witch Project and you spent $25,000 making that movie and it makes $100 million, that's a successful movie. You make Lord of the Rings... I mean, you, you go in and, and make one of these IPs and you're in it for the awards. You're in it for the award season. You want the Oscars. That's what you're after. Let me tell you something. The, the, the real ones that get Oscars are the ones that don't even have to fight for it. Okay? Those are the ones that win Oscars. Those are the ones that should be winning Oscars because they don't have to put, their, put all their ads in the trays to be like, for your consideration. No. We nominated that one because when I saw it, it blew my socks off. Unless you're Academy and you're like, yeah, well, but this little artsy movie over here by, you know, so-and-so, the arty, arty director, that's the one we're going to nominate. And he'll win because he, he, he has that vision. Whatever. If you're in it for the Emmys, if you're trying to make TV for the Emmys, you think you're going to go in there and you're going to own the Emmys because you and Rings of Power are going to, like, split it or something? Like, you are in it for the wrong reason. I'll tell you right now, neither one of them are going to win the Emmy. I'll bank that right now. Dated by George... For, for ages now, like, he has lost interest in doing the hard graft of, like, finishing Winds of Winter and then doing A Dream of Spring. 
you know, what he cares about is just doing more producing, sorry, producing gigs on shows where he can just give some script ideas and then watch them get turned into these like big multi-million dollar productions and he can just show up to all these premieres with his fucking captain's hat on and get loads of pictures taken and get given loads of fake fucking accolades that yep. no one cares about. It's all about stroking the ego. It's not about doing any actual work at this point. Yep. He doesn't respect he, he doesn't he respect his base. Like, he doesn't respect his art. So he'll put out a blog post saying, "Yeah, I'm still working on Winds of Winter, but just just enjoy my other projects. You know, the things that are really easy. Just just enjoy them and, and don't hassle me because I don't want to have to do work because I'm old and tired now." That that's, that's where he's at. In that same store, in that same article, he says, uh, "I think people don't like this new stuff." Uh, I like Halo. I'm just going to put that out there. I, I never played Halo. Well, I did play Halo, but I wasn't like into Halo. Like, I played it once a long time ago. So, when I went into it, like, it was just another sci fi movie for me. Because um, I was not. The games I play, Halo is not one of the games that I play. And I actually liked the series. I didn't think it was stupendous or anything. Like, it was a solid 7, 5, 8. Out of ten, I don't like that it was nine episodes that killed my OCD. I'm like, no, you either do it at eight or you do it at ten. You don't do nine episodes. That was ridiculous. But I actually like Halo. Just need to change things because otherwise they get bored. They don't want to write the same old stories in the same old uh, universes. I'm like, uh, that's why he hasn't finished the book. He sees continuing those stories, not as new stories that you write for the old characters, but he sees it as just boring old content. He wants to move on to the next thing. And he sees it as old because he never got to it because he never sat down and did the work with it. He wanted to do this and that and everything else in between and then the series came along and he wanted to be executive producer on that and show up for a day a week and get paid a million dollars. That's why. Now he has to actually sit down and do it. Even though he had two years of COVID sitting at home doing nothing, he couldn't get those books written. He just doesn't know. He doesn't care anymore. He doesn't care about the property. He doesn't care about the fan base. He doesn't care about the work. Period. Yeah, and that, that's why you have to set yourself a deadline to finish it. Yeah, I, was, I would appreciate that if it would, like, if he was honest about that. If he said, guys, I've lost my passion for writing this, I'd be like, that happens, and that's fair. Pass it to somebody who is. Yes, that's a good point, Muller. Listen, this doesn't just apply to books. This applies to movies, too. George Lucas came out and said he didn't want to do 7, 8, and 9. So when Disney came to him and offered him $4.1 billion to buy a Lucasfilm, he was like, yeah, sure, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm played out. I don't really want to do it anymore. I think he had a bad experience after doing 1, 2, and 3, and I think he was afraid to go back and do it. And he and he was like, I'm willing to pass this off to somebody else, especially after... And then Rogue One did really well, and then they passed it off to, you know, to Abrams to do 7, 8, and 9, and he was able to let go of it. And do it, and 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 good for him for doing so. So yeah, you can take what you've started and pass it on to somebody else, and let somebody else pick it up and run with it. The problem is, is that if you don't have somebody that respects the property, you end up with what you have with going on with Star Wars right now, and you have and you have going on with like people not happy with Ben Kenobi because they're not because because they're betraying the character. And they had people like upset with Boba Fett because you write an entire series for Boba Fett, and yet you use a Boba Fett that's thirty years too old, and you have two entire episodes where he's not even in it. Like, what are you doing? Like, so if you just wanted to do Mandalorian three point five, you should have done like a five episode Boba Fett and a five, four episode Mandalorian. That's what you should have done. But no, they're, they don't respect the characters. They don't respect the writing. Even Abrams didn't respect Star Wars enough to write out a three-film treatment. So 
so that the th so if he didn't want to do eight and he had to pass it off to somebody else, which he did to Rian Johnson, you still had an outline to go by so that you had a lattice work of inter interconnecting the characters and, and driving everybody to that home point. Instead, you had Rian Johnson come in and just completely flub it. Um, every, everything on the, I, I felt like um, Ray's story was good. Everything else in there was crap. I still get irked when I think about those space scenes. The 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 kill shot with the jump to light speed on on the on the first order ship was amazing. Aside from that, if you if you're in a ship flying through space and you're at your max speed, you shut off your engines. You're not going to drift back into range firing range of the of the people behind you. There's no drag in space. You keep going at that speed. Star Trek explained that to us several times if you ever cared to watch an episode. You get up to speed, you shut off your engines, you reserve energy, and you're going to cruise at the same speed for a million miles. Because there's no drag, there's no resistance. And Rian Johnson just completely flubbed that. Just, it take, when, you, when you can't even follow basic physics, it completely takes you out of the story. And it just looks stupid. Right? Everybody still makes fun of George Lucas for saying that the, that, the, that the Millennium Falcon made that flight in 12 parsecs. A parsec is not a unit of time. A parsec is a unit of space. Okay? A parsec, one parsec equals uh, uh, how far light can travel in one minute or something like that. I can't even remember anymore. But it's not a unit of time. You didn't do it in 12 Par seconds, you did it in, you know, but and then they and then when they did solo, they had to retcon it right to make it look like he ran that 14 parsec run in 12.5 parsecs because he took a shortcut or something, right? So it happens, but you're not even paying attention to it, and then you have to come in with episode nine and the Emperor's back, and Snoke was actually a clone of the Emperor, and like, come on, why, why didn't you set this up? Why didn't you set this up and have an entire outline so that if anybody else came back, because Abram had to come back and fix it after Johnson messed it up. I'm rambling. Yeah, th this is this is the thing, right? As a just a purely creative endeavor. You just call me Rick. Is y'all talking to me? Write whatever you want. You know, like if you want to spend, you know, years of your life doing like a, a multi-volume companion set to the main narrative. That's, that's within your purview to do but your fans are not obliged to read it and they're not obliged to enjoy it um, and when you're a, a, a commercially successful author like he is you're not just a guy who's doing this for your pleasure and you can listen to Critical Drinker on this because he's a successful author, he has several books out you need to check him out he knows what he's talking about and so you've got your fan base who made you what you are they made you the success that you are and they made you extremely wealthy and very successful you have entered into a contract with them and you now owe them something and so you might not want to do it but like you need to finish that that book as a, a moral obligation almost to them Agreed. because they're the people that made you successful in the first place you've got to give them something back and I hate this petulant fucking childish attitude of like well you should just enjoy whatever I choose to produce no matter how like fucking random it is and how unrelated it is to what you're actually invested in because it's me you're bought into me as a, as a brand it's like no they're not they care about the narrative that you were weaving yep that's what's important to them they don't fucking care about like whatever random vanity project you want to take on or whatever prequel you want to do that's not what they're interested in they want a conclusion to a song of ice and fire and if you're too fucking lazy to do it now like yeah you need to pass it on to someone else who can actually conclude it excellent i'm going to stop it right there uh i'm, I'm going to let you go i'm going to post the original link below so you can go check out the rest of that conversation um but he makes it he makes a very good point it, it is a moral you you have you have you have you have a moral obligation because you have signed this contract with your fan base. I will write these books. I will bring you into this world. I will develop these characters and, and let you fall in love with them. And I will give you a complete story. And if I and if I'm not there to finish it, I will have a, a backup. Somebody will finish the story one way or the other. Right? It's it's. 
yeah, it's something that irks me. I've, I've wanted to be a writer all my life. I haven't done it. I have a couple books in process right now. I don't know if I'll ever finish them. But that was something that a long time ago was like, if I do these, like I am committed to them. If I want to write a 5, 10, 15 book series and state up front that it's going to be that long, I owe it to my readers to supply that. You know, it, it's 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 what I've obligated myself to. It's a, what I've, I know, and it's an obligation that you have said, okay, I will buy your books. I will get invested in your property. You better deliver. Okay, don't come up short on me. You know, don't 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 just wax out you know, you know, halfway through or something like that. Don't sit there and make me wait three, four, five years for the next installment. And you're going off and, and doing your little Hollywood thing and you're going off and you're doing other books because they're more interesting and they're more hip and or or whatever it is. That's that's as as a writer, as a as a creative, like you owe it to people that invest in your property to to give them what you've pay, what you've what you've promised them and if you're coming out saying this is book one of a three-part series anybody who buys that book and says this is part one of book book if i get invested in this you better give me part three i better get part two and i better get part three and, and i don't want them you know in 2025 and then 2030 i want them you know a year from now or a year and a half from now or whatever the schedule is if you can't write a book in one year you you, you know what are you doing because because that's that's your job, right? If you're gonna if you're if you're buckling down to write this series, you can write a series in one year, two years. Because by the time I buy book one, book two should already be at an editor. Then book three, you should be in the process of writing book three. That's that's what a committed writer does. If you're gonna be a writer, if you're a full time writer, like that, that, that's your commitment. And if you got three book and if you got three books slated to come up, you've already signed a contract with the editor. So this is your job now, right? You've already got the advance. If you could, man, yeah. This this hits me. It hits me. It, it, I don't know why it hits me. I've grown up with a lot of books. I've grown up with a lot of movies, and and I've seen this happen before, and it irks me. And it's one of the reasons why I don't like to like jump in on a new series that I might be iffy on because if you're going to go one season and then kill it like why am I investing my time in your characters you know like when I hear like there's a you know there's a half season ordered for this show I'm like okay so that's going to be 13 episodes if you're on network TV that's 13 episodes uh, and, and I get involved in those 13 but it's like yeah we don't have the ratings so we're going to kill it look at Firefly that's what happened to Firefly right now luckily they were able to he was able uh, Whedon was able to spin that around and, and bring out the movie and kind of wrap everything up in a bow but it, 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 it makes you gun shy you don't want to like start getting invested in characters and invested in the story if the network is just going to kill it because it's not number five in the demographic right everything has to be a hit and 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 so it always makes me like kind of iffy and now I'm, luckily I'm at the point in life where you know something can come out and if it and if it lasts a year I can go back and binge it and watch it again and catch up if they renewed it for the second season but if it's not renewed I can go into it and be like okay I want to go back and watch that but I know I'm going to get a cliffhanger at episode 13 that's never going to be resolved but at least I'm going in knowing that I'm not being baited in this time and then being hung out to dry so, yeah, I guess that's how I feel about that. So, what do you think? I'd love to hear your comments on it. Uh, are you a fan of GRRM? Um, are you a fan of, of, of the uh, Game of Thrones world, Westeros? Are you looking forward to House of Dragon? I'd love to hear it. Uh, I'd love to hear your comments on it. So, please, drop me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Hit like, hit subscribe, share this. The more comments, the better. In the meantime, y'all have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for coming in and spending some time with me. Have a good one.